është një nga personalitetet më të respektuara të kulturës evropiane. Më 2019, undërua me qmimin Menagjere Evropiane Kulturës në ceremonin e European Culture Brand Awards. Në Prishtin ka ardhur për të bërë takimet e para të rëndësishme për Bienalen Evropiane Nomade Manifesta 2022. Një këqire se cilës dhe tjetë kryqteti Kosovës. Në agent ka ndara dhe 30 minuta për këtë intervjist për të shpalosur të regimin unik të nxarjës që e të mëllë 25 vjetë më parë. Më njëmë 1993, manifesta u themelua si dëshmi se një bienale në lëvizi mund të shëndrojt në nxarje relevante për të i kohës kur zë vend, duke lënë të rashëgimi dhe angazhem për preokupimi shëqërore e politike të sësotmës. Cila do tjetë Bienalia e Prishtinës, a duhet manifesta të arimendoj konceptin nomad që e karakterizon si e shetë drejtu e si asa e skene në artit pas Covidit. Në oborin e Institutit për mbrojti në monumenteve në një intervjist për kohën, Zonja Hedvig Fejen. Welcome in Prishtina. Great to meet you finally. I've been watching press conferences on your previous visit in Prishtina. And um, I'm so happy that we have a, we will have a chance in the next few minutes to talk about um, Manifesta and about uh, the Pristina edition. So thank you for, for being you here. Thank you for inviting me. I will start this interview um, with a maybe simple question. For, I would like first to know for those who might not had the chance to, to, to hear about Manifesta, what, what was the idea of Manifesta when it was initially founded and um, now 25 years later when you are preparing for the uh, next edition Pristina will be the host of um, a very important anniversary for, for, for you. Well thank you for inviting and indeed uh, maybe to tap into the origin of Manifesta I founded Manifesta 25 years ago actually um, as a kind of result of a question from many Western countries, there were eight European countries, like getting together and asking how is it possible that curators, artists, let's say from Western countries are not in touch uh, so much with their partners in Warsaw, Moscow, Ljubljana, Bratislava, and we even face examples of that Artists could not travel from Vienna to Bratislava, to, from Berlin to Dresden. So, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, there was a general call for a kind of pan-European event. And it was like a, a group of... Uh, I worked for the national government as a curator, and I was like 30 years old, and they invited me to get together with my generation of people in Europe, artistic people, and to understand is there a need to balance the gap between East and West and what sort of, let's say, what sort of model could this be? And I think there were three main issues which were important at that moment. Mobility, so after the, this kind of forms uh, in the European Union about Erasmus, there was this idea, I'm born in Ljubljana, I can study in Berlin, and I find a job in London. So this kind of mobility for the young generation. Second, no national representation. So this means um, artist organizations, curators want to represent a larger few than just a national representation. And third, maybe giving uh, access to a young generation, because before, only after 20, 30 years, you were able to do a biennial, but we thought, let's start with giving young people a kind of access and a, and a, and a presentation. So these were the three um, major conditions where we started working in 1993. Um, it was only possible to create a kind of pan-European character by George Soros because immediately I understood that if I want to work and include all the kind of uh, former cent Central and Eastern European countries, that maybe we should not count on the old regime, but we should find also new partners for a new generation, and these were the Soros Centers for Contemporary Art. 
And uh, Susanna Mesoli, who was the, the head of these Soros centers, she was able to convince George Soros to pay actually for the, ne for the next 10 years for all the participation of those artists, those curators, but also to give access to Western curators to do research. So the system somehow fell together. And then the first manifesto started in Rotterdam, the Netherlands, and then we moved slowly from one uh, city to another. Maybe this is also part of this kind of mobility. We thought, of course, you can do it always in the Netherlands, but what would be, let's say, the ultimate consequence of mobility that you invite each city in Europe to host its own manifesta? So that's where the kind of nomadic idea comes from. And actually, René Bloch, the famous Fluxus uh, curator, he was inventing this name manifesta. Of course, a little bit reference as the kind of youngest kid on the block after the documenta, but also manifestare, which is moving, a manifesto, it's a kind of a, an attempt to change things, to create new experimental formats. So, yeah, that was manifesto 1, 1996. Now we're 25 years later, you refer to our anniversary. And I think manifesto 13, 14, we just closed Manifesto 13 in Marseille, France was our first presence there. Now we are here in Kosovo and I think the selection of Pristine as the host city of Manifesto 14 is crucial and I think things come together here. Um, how, do you, how do you, most of people think that you choose a city but it's, it's not like what it is. No, no, absolutely. <laughs> like, yeah, like to, to can Maybe you tell I can us, explain yeah, a can little explain bit a little about bit? the methodology because it's a little bit playing the Olympics in terms of we invite cities to make a bid. And I think this is also a different format than any other biennial. First, we are mobile, so we change places every two years. We have a head organization in Amsterdam. But secondly, we invite cities to come up with a pro proposal. What is urgently needed in your city? What do you like manifest as a kind of incubator to do in your city? In which circumstances? What sort of relevance? And mostly the kind of bids come from arts organizations, curators, sometimes the municipality together with local museums or arts uh, institutions. And always there is a kind of a commissioning part. There is a kind of what we call engaged autonomy. So partly, of course, manifest as an autonomous organization, but we work together with existing organization because if we would completely stay outside, let's say, the governance model or municipalities, then there's no ability to change. And most of the time manifesta is invited as I said, as a kind of incubator to stimulate certain transformational formats, to help create certain institutional bases, or as we discussed before, um, refurbishment of different heritage sites or revitalization of certain areas, but also to bring in international networks. In these 25 years, we engaged with many, many different institutions in Europe. Also because we're constantly moving to different places, so we can also easily connect. Secondary, I think, because of the autonomy, the engaged autonomy, we're also looking constantly what does fit in a certain city. So, obviously, the model for Pristina is not going to be copied as the model for Marseille. The model for Marseille which was taking place, the addition taking place in a quite uh, political uh, problematic period in France with uh, the protest of the Gilles Jaune, the Yellow Vest. So Manifesta is not this kind of acting in its own kind, small artistic bubble. We react in a kind of social, always in a social, artistic, political way on what is happening in a city. And I think coming back to your question, why Pristine in the Western Balkan, in Kosovo, is so important. I think because of the geographical uh, area, we haven't been here. And I think the area is 20 years after the war, the youngest sovereign country in Europe. There's a lot to explore. Hopefully there's a lot to bring. And maybe Manifesta can help 
realize something in connection, of course, with the municipality, but also especially with the community of artistic and social organizations. And I think it's, it's not by accident, even if we didn't foresee, nobody could foresee, that Manifesta takes place 14 in a post-COVID situation, hopefully next year in 2022. And also is maybe going to show how and what a biennial, what relevance a biennial can be in a post-COVID situation. You mentioned that you have um, like one thing that makes Manifesta unique is the, the methodology. And it's like, to me, it sounds like it's starting from, from the scratch, let's say, you know, and it's quite demanding, I suppose, um, and challenging at the same time. Have you ever thought of maybe at one point Manifesta will stop and like lose its nomadic um, Definitely. Actually, it's quite interesting you raised this issue because we did think and that maybe at a certain moment, maybe after 25 years, Manifesta has grown up. Maybe Manifesta became an institution itself. How can we stay experimental? How can we maintain our relevance? Um, but I have to say, um, the team itself, which is international, we have Russians, Italians, Spanish, Fran French uh, collaborators in our team. And I see that there is a super need with this young generation of reinventing every two years, critically rethinking what the notion and the role of contemporary culture can be. And I think because we do it from a geographical, political, different perspective every two years, it keeps people extremely uh, sharp. And I think we don't have in our team the people who have this kind of typical artistic profile. Most of my collaborators also have a kind of historical background or a social background. So we are really interested in looking into creating this kind of meaningful connections understanding the histories of certain places. And uh, maybe you, you were referring to the, the methodology. Since we are coming every two years to a new city, we work long time in advance, mostly four to six years, uh, starting with mapping a city, for example, by inviting artists and uh, uh, architects and urbanists to really understand where are we, not only in a technical way, but also in a kind of anthropological way, understanding the histories of the, of the inhabitants. But we're also like uh, putting a lot of effort in creating human relationships. I mean, you can't do this work obviously by Zoom or on a distance. You need to be in the place, understand the place, create connections between the local team, the international team, and what we found out is also that every time uh, we, un we try to understand how can we find a new methodology to really connect to the local people in a kind of a way which is opening up certain procedures. So, for example, in the period of, uh, of um, uh, being in Marseille with the protest of the Gilles Jaunes, we thought it's quite crucial to understand how can we involve the voice of the citizens and how can we involve people who really want to think about the future of the city. So this is where we started with a uh, citizen assembly involving um, youngsters, but people from many, from different age, different background, different religions in really um, discussing with us the impact of this urban study, which at that time was done by uh, MVADV, an urbanistic and architectural studio, and the kind of reflection we got on this really shaped the work we did afterwards. And even more interesting, the new political scenario which was um, at place in Marseille after the election, they took the model to really install permanently. And this is maybe a kind of a, let's say, legacy impact we're looking for. We're not only an exhibition machine anymore. We're looking into kind of creating meaningful relationship, acting as an incubator, stimulate certain kind of practices and see 
if after manifest and a kind of post manifesto period, this can continue. And that's also what we're looking for here in uh, Pristine. You mentioned that you're not anymore just an exhibition machine and, um, and it's now a known fact that you've been uh, very much insisting in create, leaving a legacy after you move from one city to another, refurbishing a lot of uh, buildings. Uh, at what stage uh, are we now in Pristina? Have you ident been identifying spots where Manifesta will buildings or where Manifesta will, will settle and will work with, uh, with particular um, um, buildings? As you might have seen, we lack about having uh, and using the public spaces and also like uh, exactly. uh, a lot of buildings that we, we do have, but like they are just there, hidden and forgotten in a exactly. way. Exactly, as we are here in this beautiful space. Um, well, it's a very good question because as I already said, um, cities who want to host Manifesta describe certain ideas of what they want Manifesta to do in the bid. And um, in the bid of Pristina, there were a couple of interesting uh, leads. First, how can Manifesta help identifying and maybe reclaiming public space? Because in the kind of um, last 10 years uh, privatization uh, strategies, some of the public spaces were lost. And what sort of kind of um, practices and strategies could be behind? Secondary, the idea was also because of uh, an entire discussion here about the founding of a museum of contemporary art and the kind of um, issue with the Germia building. So could Manifesta help set up a museum? We immediately said, no, this is not our task. This is a governmental task, but we could help, of course, thinking and rethinking what is the, let's say, what are alternative model of institutions could be relevant for Pristine? Do people need a kind of art institute? Is it an artist in residence? Is it kind of workshops, more in a practical sense? Do they need an archive, um, a center for education and learning in cultural education? Um, or could it be an ecological institute, since Pristine is also quite a, a city with a, a pollution problem? So we're looking into this at this moment, and the urban vision and all the studies related to this, so it's Carlo Ratti Studios and MIT, who are now working, actually, the moment we speak, in Pristine, come up with the kind of first ideas. And then we started with Arna Macic. She is an architect from Bosnia-Herzegovina. She will start with um, citizen assembly. So also here, we will discuss with citizens, what do they think is the future of the city? What sort of topics need to be uh, touched upon? And uh, we did a series of expectation workshops, also rethinking and asking just bluntly to people from different areas, both from education, from civic society, from the arts world, what do you want Manifesta to do and what are the crucial issues at this moment? The municipality is very keen in supplying us with a kind of relevant context. And uh, we're now looking into the Suleiman Library building, if we can use this probably into refurbishing or helping to create a relevant function for this. And the municipality also asked um, uh, Carlo Ratti and his architects and urbanists to look into the brick factory. Um, a former working space, an industrial area, which could be maybe um, refurbished and revitalized into a kind of a cultural hub or a kind of um, a relevant space. We don't know in which direction it's going. So these are the three, let's say, tiers we are working on. And it's a little bit too early to say exactly which direction it goes. It is this kind of methodology which is based on research. Um, but what we really want to do is that it's both bottom-up and participatory and at the same time connecting to all the organizations in Kosovo who can have like a kind of a relevant say of this and seeing Manifesta as a kind of creative mediator. So we're mediating actually what everybody wants and maybe bringing some kind of um, important partners from abroad, creating a kind of opening up our network 
And then hopefully in September all these kind of issues and the outcome of these research is going to be presented. Then of course on basis of the outcome we will invite curators, programmers, mediators to work with us and then from September we start and then we have a little bit more than one year to fulfill all this. And that's of course the real challenge in a kind of COVID, post-COVID situation. Are we able to bring really things to life? How efficient can we be? What will be the traveling uh, situation? Is it possible that this mobility is starting again? So these are the main questions. Uh, but we're super confident because we had like very fruitful and productive meetings last few days. Everybody, it seems, is behind it. Of course, we need also critical voices. We want to learn. We want to unlearn also what should not be done. But um, we are super delighted that we finally can be here because we had like a gap of six months. We were supposed to start really working on in September to 2020. And because of COVID, we are a little bit postponed, but, but now very you confident. Set of the local team and you know, like. We are super happy that even by, and, and this is also like learning from the COVID, that we hired our team online, that we instructed them and learned from each other online, that we now have an office in the Palace of Youth and Sports, that we are investigating all the venues and yeah, that's, we have been kicking off and that's, uh, that's very thankful for this. Uh, Marseille, it seems it was quite a challenging uh, manifesto. Definitely. Yeah. And um, as an art historian, how do you see the future in arts in a post-Covid? Let's hope we will pass this because we still don't know when it's going to end. But should we rethink everything after Covid? Well, I think for Manifesta, we are facing, but we, we were one of the few, I think maybe together with the Berlin Biennale, the only Biennale which opened during COVID. And it caused, it, it caused problems, but it was also like very interesting to understand how extremely impactful is what you do. Because if we relate to Manifesta 12 in Palermo, the idea that 6,000 people fly over for an opening how many flights, how many pollution, how many kind of, you know, impactful. On the same time, cities are also expecting this kind of international. So the notion of mobility, the notion of this international tourism, the notion of how radical local can we turn a manifesto into, how many bi biennials are effective, how many art fairs are effective, how much can we incorporate this kind of traveling or are there any alternatives to this? And I think Manifesta is the first to question its own relevance. We were already looking in Marseille very much to have a local impact and to, to focus much more on local audiences. So instead of having sometimes 100, 200,000 people from abroad and Marseille was mostly local, regional and national audiences. But even in kind of education and in all kind of our other projects, we were focusing on how to interact with those audience who are normally not participating in contemporary culture. I'm not speaking only about contemporary art, but definitely in contemporary culture, involving also many kind of educational or even social cultural projects. And I think that was an extreme learning lesson for us. And we are now in a process of even reforming Manifesta, maybe in this way. Maybe using most of our budget to invest locally. Maybe still creating this kind of international network, but facilitating something which could have a longer sustainable model, also in a kind of a local context. So this could mean that if cities wants us to set up a certain institutional framework or kind of longer, uh, long-term organization, that we not only focus on getting the Manifesta edition financed till after the opening, but also thinking about the long-term perspective. So that if we have to set up an institution like here in Pristine, that we need to think, how is this institution going to survive after Manifesta has left? And I think this is a kind of social responsibility which we really want to take. We don't know exactly how this is functioning, 
but with our donors and our sponsors and our partners, we put it this on the table because I think this is the kind of changes also COVID has learned us how to create something which has a much more sustainable impact. I would like to ask you as an art historian, for sure maybe you've crossed the roads with the local artists or collectives or how, how do you know the, the local scene? Not only the local contest, but also an international one. Yeah, um, well, that's a very good question because bef two years ago when we started here, we were looking into kind of collaborative models and collective models. And the first thing we did was like mapping all the organizations on the Western Balkan uh, with whom we could collaborate, like in Macedonia, Bosnia Herzegovina, Al Albania. Uh, Serbia, but also, let's say, a Roma organization in Berlin, some organizations in the diaspora, in Germany and Switzerland. So we mapped them, we got in touch with them, and we created um, a two years project, which is funded by the Creative Europe Western Balkan, in which we collaborate in this kind of regional, regional atmosphere. These are not only like arts organizations, but also um, social organizations, civil organizations, um, and I think this is one level in which we collaborate. Of course, uh, we did a lot of visits already with local organizations. So for example, uh, we're working together with Thermokis, we're working together with Civicos, we're working together with uh, CAF, um, Kosovo Architecture Foundation, with other architectural organizations, with university. Um, and each department in Manifesta has its own partnerships. And of course, we need to build up these relationships. These were mostly uh, by Zoom. Um, but now that we can travel again, we are building up this relationship. And for example, uh, Bardim Haliti, who is in Amsterdam, is our uh, designer. We will work with him, Astrid uh, Ismaeli. He is in Amsterdam by accident. There is kind of a Kosovar a diaspora in certain Western countries. So we connect mostly uh, with them, but also like not only with the artists, but also with communities. Uh, the education department is now uh, they call it mind mapping, listen to stories of people living around the Suleiman Library. What are their histories? How did they relate to the building? What were their um, experiences? We will also do this in connection to the brick factory. So on many different levels, we concretely touch upon base and listen. For the first uh, months, the only thing we need to do is listen carefully what Manifesta 14 can mean to local community. I would like to continue the interview for for many more <laughs> minutes, but like it's um, your agenda doesn't allow this. Um, in the end, I would um, like to ask you when we will have an um, announcement about the curatorial team or a theme or around uh, Manifesta in Pristina? I think in September. We hope that next year we can open from the end of July till the end of October. That's a little bit the time frame. We hope to announce the programmers. We call them programmers at this moment because it could be like specialists, for example, in an ecological field. It could be if we're going to do something about performativity and we want to have specialists in this field. And we hope to announce this in September so that they have like one year in working. Thank you very much for the interview. Um, I hope and I believe that Manifesta will become one of those most precious moments for Pristinians and Kosovans. Um, as uh, this place is, reminds me of precious moments from my childhood. And that's why I, I um, I thought it would be a nice spot to, to like, do this interview. And thank you so much for inviting me, and especially on this kind of one of the most beautiful spots. And it's uh, so pristine, in pristine. Um, but also, uh, maybe this could be one of the venues. So you brought us on a very good idea. Thank you so much, Daria. Thank you.